The diet is supposed to be about 75% fat um, and then about 25% protein. But I think part of the problem is, is that a lot of people kind of modify it so it's like an Atkins diet. And so they eat a lot of protein um, and then a lot of fat. And so, so one of the things is, it's like the whole idea is to utilize ketones as an energy source over a glucose. However, if people are eating a lot of meat or meat-based products, then essentially your body can assimilate carbohydrates from them, and then you never really go into keto, ketoacidosis. So, um, and the other thing is, is the, um, the type of fat. So when we look at like the actual ketogenic diet, it is really a, um, a healthy fat diet. So when you think about healthy fats, you want to think about more plant-based foods um, such as avocado and extra virgin olive oil. Um, but what, what I think a lot of consumers start to miss is that there's this whole other class of fats that are saturated fats that are the unhealthy fats that actually can trigger, you know, heart disease. They can um, cause obesity. They can cause more um, cognitive type of disorders. So that's kind of what we see. And that's why I was talking about how everybody's eating bacon on the keto diet, which it's still a saturated fat. It still will cause harm to your body. It's still inflammatory. Short-term results have shown amazing results when it comes to lowering weight, um, lowering cholesterol, et cetera. But we don't know long-term results. In fact, the ketogenic diet can actually pose a lot of nutrient deficiencies. And so when your body is deficient in a lot of vitamins, minerals, um, we don't, the long-term effects could be detrimental. So although it's great for short-term, it could be a great motivation and a great booster to keep you going. But I think then we need to look at how do we tailor your diet so that you don't have um, inflammatory bio, biomarkers in your body for cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes or whatever the case may be. Weight plateaus are very common, right? Um, our body always takes the path of least resistance, meaning, you know, you change something up. Maybe you increase your exercise, maybe you decrease how many calories you're eating, and your body then starts to lose the weight to make up for that, right? But it, it catches on really quickly. Our bodies catch on. And so what happens is it gets used to what you're doing. So this is where a lot of people will do the same cardiovascular activities, you know, for over the, the six months, and they're expecting different results. But in order to keep your body from hitting those plateaus, you need to change it up. You almost need to like surprise your body, right? Um, and then same thing with food. Um, I think we base a lot of our food choices on how many calories that food has. But if we actually started to look at how many vitamins and minerals a food has, we, we probably would make smarter decisions. And so what we would see maybe is that our body wouldn't hold on to the weight as much. So the idea of nutrient dense foods, looking at those foods that have a lot of vitamins and minerals and not so many calories versus calorie dense foods would be one way to look at it. So one thing to remember is pay attention to your body. What is your body telling you, right? So a lot of people do believe that breakfast is the most important meal and they'll eat even if they're not getting hunger cues, right? Their stomach's not growling. They don't feel a little weak. They... So the one thing to remember is if you listen to your body, your body is your best indicator of when you need to eat. Um, this whole social norm of eating a, according to the clock um, is really a new phenomenon, if you think about it. Like, so when you think about our ancestors, they, they didn't have the chance to eat regularly because they didn't have the option, right? They didn't have access. Um, so what I tell my patients is actually, if you feel hungry, you should eat. But I don't recommend eating if you're not hungry. I really don't. And that's kind of where that whole intermittent fasting part comes in because, you know, we are supposed to be fasted at least 12 hours, right, from, from dinner to breakfast, hence break, break fast, right? 
Um, and I think now that we have so many options and we have so much access to food, a lot of Americans aren't even doing 12 hours of fasting, right, from night to breakfast time. So, so I kind of agree on the intermittent fasting part that we've seen a lot of good evidence to show that people can um, actually uh, regulate their, their insulin levels, their blood sugar levels, their weight, if they give their body a chance to actually fast. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, encourage prolonged fasting, but the whole idea of breakfast should be just when you break your fast. So I don't think it necessarily needs to be that when you wake up and, you know, you must eat within one to two hours. I think it's whatever your lifestyle and whatever your body is telling you is the best indicator for that. If you're talking about weight loss, you know, more research has shown that if it's slow, gradual weight loss of one to two pounds a week, that's going to be more sustainable. Um, but people who are dropping 10 pounds in a week, it's not real weight loss, right? Um, I think what people kind of forget when you when you go towards a low carbohydrate diet or a keto diet um, is that when you when your body is using all the carbohydrate stores, it drops a lot of water weight. So that's that first 10 pounds that you might see. Um, the other thing to remember is habits take about 21 days to make. Um, and the one thing that I always stress to a lot of uh, people is you need to actually start small so that you can yield big results. So what I mean by that is if you're not doing something five days a week right now and that you set that goal for five days a week, how realistic is that, that you're actually going to meet that goal and keep that goal going? Um, so I really work on small changes and, and starting maybe a couple of days a week if you're not used to doing something. And then after a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, if you're used to it, then let's tag on a little more, right? Whether it be more fruits and vegetables, more days a week, or maybe it'd be less soda, right, throughout the week, et cetera. But I think the problem is with the New Year's resolutions is a lot of times it's like an entire shift in somebody's lifestyle. And then what we see is an, at the six month mark, it tends to be, you know, like they, they no longer can sustain it and they go back into their old routine. The Whole30 is pretty well-rounded. The, the thing is, is that it takes out beans and whole grains. Um, and we know B vitamins are a big uh, su source in whole grains as well as beans. So um, the other thing I, I want to caution people is when you omit certain food groups, you have to realize that the, the minute you start to add them back in, your body is going to maybe gain weight. So the goal is really to, how do you balance it, right? I, I would never recommend omission of any food group. So um, really, if your goal is to lose weight, then maybe you focus on more of the non-starchy vegetables and the lean proteins, but you still add in maybe some beans, whole grains, and fruits in your day, just not as much. And that way you can actually meet your weight loss goals without sacrificing foods that actually have a lot of good nutrients for you. We're all looking for a quick fix, mm -hmm. right? But we know there is no quick fix. So that's first and foremost that I talk to people about. But the other part is, is if, if it makes you feel good and it gets you motivated to do more healthy things, then I'd say go for it. But a lot of times what we see on TV and what we hear, um, you know, they're, they're basically celebrities trying things out, but there's no science behind it. Um, and just, just realize that, right? And take that into account. If you really wanna start looking into science, I mean, there are certain places I would go, Cleveland Clinic, um, Mayo Clinic, Harvard, those, those are going to look at the science behind whatever um, fad is out there and kind of either give you the reasons why it works or debunk the reasons why people are saying it works.
Water absolutely is a necessary nutrient for our bodies, right? Um, and a lot of people, you know, actually go towards more of the sugar or the caffeinated um, laden drinks, which can actually dehydrate our bodies. Um, and I wouldn't say that everybody needs to drink eight ounces, um, eight glasses, um, eight eight ounce glasses of water. Um, what I would say is listen to your body um, and see what other foods you're eating. If you're eating a high salt diet, then yeah, you may need more water. Or if you're exercising rigorously, then maybe you need more water. Um, but really, the color of your urine is your best indicator. If it's pale, pale, then you're good. Um, but then the other thing is, is the room temperature versus cold um, versus hot. So there was a research study that came out on, on hot beverages and how it may increase our risk of um, precancerous cells in our esophagus. Um, but when it comes to the temperature of the waters, I would say that um, your body has to regulate that temperature of the water before it actually utilizes it. So um, when it comes to more of the Eastern medicine world, room temperature beverages are considered the best temperature. I don't care if it's organic or not, if it's a fruit or vegetable, you're always going to get benefits out of that fr fruit or vegetable, regardless of if it's organic. The goal really is to eat more fruits and vegetables, which Americans don't do well. Um, so I would recommend that if your budget allows, then you go with the clean 13, right? And those tend to be the ones that um, are organic, but uh, you eat the skins of those foods or the lettuces, right? Um, so if you can't peel it, then and maybe organic would be a better uh, bet. But if your budget doesn't allow it, then washing your fruits and vegetables well is fine too. When it comes to non-GMO, so genetically modified organisms, um, that's essentially where scientists start to manipulate the genetic pool of a food um, to make it maybe like uh, frost resistant or um, produce more yield, et cetera, or pest resistant. Um, so it depends on you. Um, it, de it depends on the consumer, on if the consumer once foods that have not been manipulated by scientists. Um, but I will say that when we talk about genetically modified organisms, we've been genetically modifying foods for a very long time. Um, and so you just kind of got to be a little careful on what you're looking for. For instance, like uh, corn. Corn is a genetically modified uh, food that resists pests, like BT corn. So if you're looking for maybe not so many um, many ways to like uh, prevent pesticide use in your foods and maybe going towards non-GMO would be a better um, option for you. Grains um, tend to be refined unless if we are looking for 100% whole grain. So really be on the lookout for what tortillas you're buying, what bread you're buying, um, you know, what pasta you're buying, because a lot of times it tends to be a refined grain. And the problem with the refined grain is that it strips the nutrients out of there, it strips the fiber out of there, and Americans already don't get enough fiber. Um, and as we know, fiber is great for regularity, but then it also is great for our microbiome, our gut health. Um, and so if we don't feed our guts, then we don't keep those good bacteria around. Um, so I, str I, str I stress the whole food, or the, I'm sorry, no. swipe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I stress the whole grain, whole foods approach, really, because that way you're getting the, the least amount of manipulation in your food from, from the manufacturers. Right. Anti-inflammatory diet is actually more of a plant-based diet that utilizes fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, those healthy fats from plants, um, as well as fatty fish. Um, and that diet has actually been shown to reduce the inflammation, the underlying inflammation in our bodies, which could be linked to reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes, as well as some cancers. So um, amidst all the, the wonderful diet fads that we have, um, the anti-inflammatory diet and the Mediterranean diet are really the ones that are key to help you live a long, healthy life without